Welcome to the Inner College Graduate Degree Program in Material Science and Engineering at Penn State's informational session. This recording was part of our 2022 Fall Virtual Open House held on November 16th. If you would like more information or have questions about the Graduate Degree Program, please email gradoffice at matsy.psu.edu. My name is John Morrow, and I am a professor of material science and engineering here at Penn State and also chair of our graduate program. Um, so let me start off by just mentioning this exciting news that um, so the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. Uh, ranks different um, research at different universities in different areas based on um, the amount of research funding that is coming in. And for the fourth year in a row, uh, Penn State breaks number one in the country for material science and number two for materials engineering, um, which is a great testament to the, the very active research programs that we have here in material science and engineering um, in all aspects of materials, whether it is uh, you know, polymers and organic materials or ceramics and glass, metallurgy, composites, um, 2D materials. There's just very active research going on in so many different aspects of material science. Um, now, one of the first things that you might note about our program here is that it's what's called an intercollege graduate degree program. And this is um, kind of an, an acknowledgement of the fact that material science is an interdisciplinary research field. You know, we cover different aspects of materials physics, chemistry, engineering. Um, there are students who work in a you know, wide variety of different materials chemistries, different aspects of material science from synthesis to different types of characterization, theory, modeling, and simulations. It's a very uh, broad field. And we have um, a department here of material science and engineering that has about 30 faculty members within our department. Our graduate program encompasses all of that. So it encompasses all of our 30 faculty members within the department, but we have another roughly 50 faculty members who are appointed to our graduate program across other departments at Penn State. So these are faculty members who are in say chemical engineering, physics, chemistry, energy and mineral engineering, mechanical engineering, biological engineering, and so on, all of whom are conducting cutting edge research related to material science. And so for you as, as prospective graduate students in material science and engineering at Penn State, please know that we don't have these boundaries across our departments. Uh, you can be advised by a faculty member within the Department of Material Science and Engineering, or you can be advised by another faculty member from a different department who is appointed to our graduate faculty. Uh, from the point of view of our program and from the point of view of the students, it, it doesn't make any difference. Um, and so what this means is that we've got a really diverse set of faculty expertise across these um, various uh, departments and across these uh, 80 different faculty members. We also have unparalleled research facilities here. I know when I first visited Penn State, my, my jaw just dropped at the amount of uh, facilities that we have here, including at this building, the uh, so-called Millennium Science Complex. And uh, I'll show you a little bit of that and we'll see some of that um, at our tour later today. Um, so in addition to the research expertise, there's also a really wide selection of different courses that are available for you to take. Um, we have three core courses that everyone has to take, but then you, you would take three elective courses beyond that, and they can be graduate courses um, from material science and engineering or relevant courses from any of these other departments. So there's a lot of flexibility here um, in terms of both the research that you can pursue and the courses that you can take. Uh, so the way that our, our um, graduate program is organized, our intercollege graduate degree program or IGDP. Um, so the chair of the program uh, comes from the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Uh, so that's me right now. Uh, we have a co-chair who comes from a different department. Uh, that's currently Dr. Patrick Lenahan, who is a professor in engineering science and mechanics. Uh, we also have two graduate program coordinators who help with uh, everything to do with all of the logistical aspects of 
um, of the program and being a student here. So that is uh, Sue Hyde, who is on the call today, and uh, Haley Barnes. Uh, so moving ahead, uh, the requirements for our PhD uh, program in material science and engineering are a minimum of 30 credit hours, 30 graduate credits, and that includes a minimum of six uh, research credits. Um, the three core courses uh, that are required are this MATC 501 course, which is thermodynamics of materials, MATC 503, which is kinetics of materials, and MATC 512, which is principles of crystal chemistry. Uh, those are each three credit hour courses. Uh, we also require our students to take uh, the colloquium each semester, which is a run one credit hour course, uh, which is mostly external speakers who, who come in. Um, in addition to that, you would need to take three uh, 500 level elective courses. And as I mentioned, there's a, a wide variety of these courses to choose from. So you can work together with your advisor to select the combination of electives that make the most sense. So if you're studying polymers, for example, you wanna make sure you take all these polymers electives. If you're focusing on characterization or on ceramics or whatever, there are appropriate classes for those as well. Um, everything beyond that would be uh, research credits, which is the 600 level one. And in addition to that, in your first semester here, we do have uh, a required one credit hour course on uh, professional development, which is this MATC 582 course that covers uh, a lot of really practical tips about how to be successful both in graduate school and in your future career. It also covers um, some important aspects of professional ethics, writing papers, intellectual property, things like that. Um, beyond these credit requirements, um, you know, as is, is typical for uh, PhDs in the US, uh, there are three uh, benchmark examinations on the way to, um, to getting your PhD. The first is the qualifying exam, which is taken within the first uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, the next would be the comprehensive exam, which is taken about a year after that, kind of in towards the middle of your PhD. And then, of course, the final uh, dissertation and the defense of that. Um, so beyond academics, we've got a lot of great opportunities for professional development in our program. Uh, we've got really active student groups here. For example, uh, the Materials Research Society actually was originally started here at Penn State by a Penn State professor. And we still have a, a very active Materials Research Society chapter that is run by the graduate students. And they've got all types of activities, both social activities, professional development activities, and so on. Uh, we do not require students to be a teaching assistant, but if you would like to um, to volunteer as a teaching assistant, um, I know faculty are, are usually very welcoming of that. So for example, if you want to go on to become a faculty member after your PhD, it's gr a great idea to get that teaching experience and we can offer that for you as well. Uh, we also have really strong connections with industry. Um, this includes an annual materials day, which is a bit of a misnomer that it actually goes on for two days every year where we bring in several hundred people from, um, from around the country and, and even internationally, uh, many of whom are industry people who are interested in um, learning more about research at Penn State. So that's a, a great way to meet people from industry. Uh, we also have an external advisory board, which is mostly uh, people from industry as well, and they are really actively engaged with our department and love to, to meet with the students as well. Now, uh, a couple of words about our admission process. So the way that it works here at Penn State is, of, of course, we've got a, a minimum set of requirements um, for admission, which are listed on our website. Uh, but beyond that, admission is based on providing or on finding a suitable fit with a specific research group here. Um, and so the process is that you would be submitting your applications either uh, this fall or in early January. Earlier is better, please. Um, and then the uh, you know the the, appli the applications will be circulated to faculty members, and you know if they uh, think that particular students are are interesting uh, for their groups, they can reach out to them directly to set up um, Zoom calls or or phone calls beforehand. Um, 
we will uh, compile a list of uh, prospective students to bring for an on-campus open house, which will be held at the end of February next year. And during the in-person open house, that'll give you a chance to, to, of course, see our buildings and facilities in person, but more importantly, to, to meet with um, the students and faculty here uh, to try to find a, a good fit, a good match between the faculty members and the students. And then the specific offers will be made based on that combination of, of meeting the requirements for admission and, and finding a, a suitable match with the faculty members here. Uh, a few words about our graduate assistantships. Um, our assistantships that we offer cover both a stipend and tuition. Uh, this is for the duration of your PhD here at Penn State. Um, and so we uh, basically make offers based on having um, the funding available for through um, research projects through the PI. Um, our assistantships also in include uh, good insurance that includes both healthcare, uh, dental insurance, as well as vision insurance, and some of those details are provided here. Um, and just uh, be careful when considering competing offers from other universities as well. Uh, make sure that you check not just the, uh, the salary that's being offered, but other benefits such as insurance, and it's also a good idea to check on uh, cost of living, because, you know, cost of living in central Pennsylvania is quite different than, say, cost of living in the San Francisco Bay Area, for example. Um, now, a little bit about some of our facilities here, and uh, Angela will, will show you more in a moment. Um, we've got, in material science and engineering, uh, two main buildings for our department. Uh, about half of our department is in this building called the Millennium Science Complex. Uh, this building is, what, it's barely a decade old at this point. It's a quarter of a billion dollar uh, building that was um, made to house our Materials Research Institute. And so we've got um, you know, faculty members here from across a wide variety of different, different departments um, that come together for this Materials Research Institute. And it's a great... Um, place to to interact and to build collaborations across different departments what's really cool about this building is what is buried underneath this garden here so underneath this beautiful garden there are about 15 uh, buildings that are or, uh, rooms that are about as isolated as possible from uh, mechanical and electrical noises and um, we've got labs there for our materials characterization um, facilities. And we've got a, a large number of uh, SEMs, TEMs, all kinds of characterization equipment buried under there um, to give like the, the best possible um, noise-free um, characterization. Now, at our Materials Research Institute, this cuts across, um, much like our graduate program, it cuts across different colleges. So five different college, it could, colleges, it cuts across 15 different departments, bringing together over 200 faculty members who have a common interest in doing materials research. And this includes not only the approximately 210 graduate students in material science and engineering, but also hundreds of graduate students in other related fields, such as chemical engineering and so on. Uh, the Millennium Science Complex has about 40,000 square feet of quiet lab space uh, shielded from vibrations and electromagnetic noise. Uh, we also have about a 10,000 square foot uh, class 1,000 1, and 100 clean room and about 4,000 square feet of collaborative space. So at our Millennium Science Complex, we've got a fully staffed open access analytical research facility that includes uh, our NanoFab, which is an amazing facility for, um, for synthesis. Uh, we've got piezoelectric and pyroelectric complex oxide, epitaxiographing devices and research, atomic layer deposition, lithography on curved surfaces, and um, the complementary characterization techniques. And as I mentioned, uh, buried uh, beneath that garden is our materials characterization laboratory. So uh, an amazing building with um, world-class uh, facilities. The other half of our department, including myself, um, we're located in the Stido building. And if you look at the front of the Stido building, you see this beautiful facade from when this was originally built back in the 1920s. Uh, but the entire building was renovated um, 
this is, if you look at the back of the building, it's a, a completely modern facade here. And um, the, the, the inside of the building is all new. Um, so we've got department offices here, a computer lab for students, uh, a number of conference rooms, student common areas as shown here. Uh, we also have beautiful laboratories in this building, um, including shared laboratory spaces across um, three different floors here with these beautiful glass windows so you can see in. Uh, this includes undergraduate teaching labs on the ground floor, advanced processing, mechanical testing, 3D printing, nanoparticles, uh, polymers lab, rheometry, uh, glass lab, thermal properties, and uh, computational lab as well. One of the one of the many areas that Penn State is very strong in is in materials computation. Uh, we have a materials computational center on campus that uh, has uh, many of the world's leading experts in materials computation uh, affiliated with it. So you'll hear from Dr. Dabo today. He's one of the world's leading experts in density functional theory. Uh, the chair of our department is Dr. Susan Sinnott, who is uh, one of the inventors of reactive force fields for molecular dynamics simulations, as well as Professor Audrey Van Doon, who is the inventor of Reacts FF for um, simulating chemical reactions in MD. Uh, Kristen Fichtthorn, who is the inventor of Kinetic Monte Carlo. Uh, and Zikwe Lu, who is uh, the head of CalFAD and one of the, the leading experts in computational thermodynamics. Longqing Chen, who's one of the, the world's biggest experts in phase field modeling, uh, and more. Basically, any type of materials computation, uh, we've got one of the world's leading experts in those areas. Uh, research funding at Penn State uh, comes from a wide variety of different sources, uh, including about 30% coming from uh, defense, about 16% from Department of Energy, about 15% from industry, 22% from the National Science Foundation, 5% from National Institutes of Health, NASA, and so on. Uh, all of this amounts to uh, over $100 million a, a year in materials-related research spending. So it's, it's a very active research program. Uh, one of the things that drew me to Penn State is um, its industrially friendly uh, research policies. Uh, so Penn State has very close connections with uh, industry, both in terms of them actually coming here to Penn State to use our facilities because they're such great facilities, uh, but also sponsoring research and working together closely um, with our faculty members here. So if whether you know you're interested in going on for your career in academia or industry or national labs, um, there should be a really good path for you here uh, in our program at Penn State. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn this over now to um, to the other speakers here. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, John Shamanic. I am co-advised by Dr. Allison Beasy and Dr. Zikwe Liu. Um, but today I'm just going to give a quick overview of uh, what's going on in structural materials research uh, here at Penn State. So um, obviously we have uh, Dr. Beasy, not biased, but um, she's listed first here, uh, and so we do multi-scale experimental and computational investigations. So we have like a little dog bone sample here that we can pull um, mechanically uh, and get data that way. But it's also start, starting to be at a scale where we can look at the microstructure and do some uh, comparable computations for uh, polycrystal multi-phase uh, mechanical deformation, um, even down to some single crystal constitutive behavior laws. Um, we also have uh, a lot of people in our group working on additive manufacturing, and that's kind of a theme through a couple of these. Uh, the next is uh, Dr. DeBroy, who does uh, these really fine um, multi-physics simulations of melt pools in um, welding and additive manufacturing. Um, and another person working on this uh, similar area is Dr. Palmer over here, who does uh, a more general take on additive manufacturing. Um, you can see uh, one of the tools building building a wall here, and then these different models of um, your melt pool uh, and over different heights. So we also have uh, Dr. Kim, who does electrochemical processing, um, which is uh, really important if you're talking about like nuclear waste streams and how to recover certain elements. Um, and so they do a lot of work whose applications uh, lean toward recycling, uh, but also uh, corrosion. 
Uh, we have Dr. Moda, who is in uh, nuclear uh, departments, but because the uh, graduate program allows you flexibility, you can totally be in that group and be in the same degree program. So even though they're in nuclear, they focus on uh, materials for nuclear applications, which presents a couple different uh, interesting issues, new damage mechanisms, uh, new things that you have to worry about as a materials engineer. Um, we also have a relatively new faculty, Dr. Pagan, who does um, uh, who came from a high energy synchrotron uh, background. And so he looks at uh, what you can get um, from x-rays, uh, looking at these polycrystals during deformation and um, how they relate to the models that you can generate. Uh, and also some data analytics in the sense that you get a lot of data from these experiments if you do in situ with x-ray and you can kind of try to backfit what, uh, what each grain should be doing in a, in a modeling sense. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, we also have Dr. Wolf, who does a lot of um, uh, application-driven research, I would say, in the area of like thermal barrier coatings and uh, high temperature ceramics uh, coatings in general. Um, and then we have this uh, nearby facility, which is SIMP3D, which is uh, has a lot of um, resources for additive manufacturing. They have machines that actually do the builds there. And they also have uh, some characterization, and that's in Innovation Park, which is uh, separate but nearby. Um, and that kind of goes comes back to the close tie for industry because this is a little bit more application focused than uh, the rest of the research going on. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Ismail Dabo. I'm extremely happy to to be here, and I hope uh, that you are also happy to discover uh, our program and that uh, this event will further convince you that Matsi at Penn State could be an ideal environment for your graduate studies. So I'm going to tell you, tell you about computational research. Uh, I probably do not need to, to convince you of the uh, importance of materials if you're here today. Uh, materials are everywhere, uh, and they're critical to the technologies that we use on a daily basis. Uh, but what we often do not realize about materials is the time it takes uh, to develop and discover uh, those materials from the time they're found in the laboratory to the time they're brought to the market. And in that regard, I have here uh, some uh, uh, interesting uh, piece of statistics that it takes on average 10 to 20 years uh, to discover a new material and develop it uh, to the point that it can uh, be uh, incorporated into technology. So uh, this is illustrated uh, in this uh, little timeline here. For example, even though people had interest in uh, titanium since the late 40s, uh, it took uh, more than 15 years for this to be brought to the market for biomedical and for uh, aeronautical applications. The same is true for lithium ion battery materials and fuel cell materials. So in light of this, there is a, a need to accelerate materials discovery and development. And this is where uh, the increasing computational capabilities uh, can be used uh, in order to accelerate this process. And there have been several major uh, uh, evolutions in the field of computational material science. And one of them is the uh, possibility to predict the fundamental properties and the performance of materials before the material is actually made. And what I have here is a, a mountain of publications. So if you take all the publications that have ever been published uh, in science, uh, in the literature, you obtain a, a mountain of publication that is almost the size of uh, Kilimanjaro. And if you look at the very top publications there, that is uh, not, 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 not more than the thickness of a bee, you will see that many of those papers at the top are actually papers about protein folding, DNA sequencing, but also about the ability to predict materials uh, from scratch using uh, quantum uh, mechanical simulations. So that's one of the evolution that enables uh, the acceleration of material discovery. Another one uh, is uh, the evolution in the uh, processing power of uh, uh, supercomputers, we are now reaching the exact scale, the possibility to uh, perform billions of billions of floating point operations per second. And this combined with uh, the revolution in artificial intelligence and the ability of a uh, very advanced algorithm enables you to uh, simulate very large systems. So for example, here you have the simulation of a, a virus. You probably have seen that uh, in, in the news. So all of this, uh, just to tell you about the increasing uh, power of comput computation is very much a driver for materials discovery. And there are a, a lot of opportunities at Penn State to work in this area. 
So Dr. Maro did a, a great job at uh, um, presenting uh, the faculty in the IGTB program. So I'll be very brief and there will be opportunity during the breakout session to uh, discuss about uh, possibilities of research in competition at, at Penn State. So Dr. Sinot works in the area of predictive quantum simulation combined with molecular dynamic simulations uh, that uh, I presented previously. And I can tell you more about uh, this slide uh, uh, in the breakout. Dr. Chen is a pioneer in the field of phase field simulation, combined again with those predictive uh, method to uh, essentially uh, anticipate the properties of material and their performance. Uh, Dr. De Broy combined machine learning uh, with finite element simulations to be able to predict uh, the uh, formability of artificial uh, of additive manufactured systems, and that's uh, very much uh, an area of interest in the department. Uh, Dr. Yu is an uh, expert in the area of computational thermodynamics combined with density differential theory. So again, uh, uh, one of the uh, top experts in that field. Uh, and Dr. Uh, uh, Wes uh, Renard works on uh, applying data-driven uh, models in order to solve inverse design problem to uh, develop materials with new, with new functionalities. And, and myself uh, 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 work in the area of uh, Competition, competition simulation applied to energy materials. So I would love the opportunity to tell you more about this. This is just a brief overview of what is available uh, in the department. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Davo. Uh, Dr. Colby, would you like to share? My name's Ralph Colby. I've been here a few years shorter forever. And um, I am interested in, in soft materials. And there's quite a lot of uh, activity in soft materials at Penn State. Um, most of that activity is uh, centered in the chemical engineering and material science and engineering departments. Uh, and so on this slide, I'm listing those faculty, and then we'll talk about some of the other faculty on the second slide. Um, so, so Chris Arges is a, is a fairly new faculty at Penn State that, uh, that is interested in electrochemical materials, and they do things like... Uh, uh, Store, storing energy and converting energy uh, from one form to the next, um, and, and with, with an emphasis on new materials. Then Enrique Gomez um, is one of the people I collaborate with quite a bit. He is um, kind of the, the guru on campus for conjugated polymers. So those are things that can conduct uh, electrons, and uh, we have great fun trying to understand how those things work. He's also an expert on uh, transmission electron microscopy of soft materials. <clears throat> Next is Scott Miller. He is a simulation person. Um, and uh, the, the, his students do lots of simulations of polymers. I think some of his top students even do analytical theory, but most of the time they, they, uh, they, they focus on, on simulations. And two of the uh, topics he's keenly interested in now are uh, how polymers entangle in the melt state and how they crystallize when we cool them down. So those are things that can be studied nicely on the computer. Um, okay, and then there's He Jung Oh, another relatively new faculty member at Penn State. And she is an expert on membranes for water purification and, and ion transport, like you might need for a fuel cell, for instance. Then there's Christian Pester, he does all things with uh, polymer surfaces and this little switchable surfaces uh, graphic over here uh, kind of shows one of the things he does. So he has um, a dye block copolymer that's, that's anchored to the surface. And in one sort of solvent, one of the blocks likes to be exposed to the solvent and the other one hates the solvent. And then in water, the, the, the situation changes. So, so you can kind of change your, you can kind of have a, uh, uh, a chameleon sort of surface that can change its character depending on how, what sort of liquid you put it in. And then there's Brian Vogt, uh, and Brian does all sorts of interesting things with hydrogels, 3D printing of polymers, and uh, energy materials, batteries, and things like this. Um, okay, and then in material science and engineering, we have Jim Adair. He's developed a lot of uh, interesting nanoparticles that can detect uh, various diseases, and then other ones that actually can be helpful for treating the diseases. Um, 
And then there's me, I'm Ralph Colby. I'm interested in polymer physics and rheology. And I just list one of my topics because I can't list everybody's, all their topics anyway. Uh, uh, and so I list the one on, on flow induced crystallization where we see how uh, a little bit of flow can make the polymer uh, crystallize faster by stretching the, the longest chains. And then our extremely new uh, faculty, Nudi Fafa Duman, is uh, actually joining our department in January, but he'll be participating in the, uh, in the recruiting this year as well, because he needs to pick up some new students uh, in the fall. So um, he does all kinds of things with conjugated polymers for uh, optoelectronics and photovoltaics. So he's kind of a little more on the device side than, uh, than Professor Gomez. And then um, we have Arara Hasegawa, uh, and she does all sorts of things with polymers for, for drug delivery, you know, including uh, tissue engineering and things like this. Then there's Rob Hickey. Uh, he's another one of my um, strongest collaborators. Um, and he has the, um, the, the unique ability in some sense of being able to make almost any polymer. And so I call on him to help me make polymers as my group isn't really so strong in that area. But he, he is most famous for his work on uh, making very nanostructured hydrogels that can actually act as actuators. So, uh, you know, we apply a field to them and they'll bend and that kind of thing, uh, kind of artificial muscles you can think of. And I actually collaborated with him mostly on another topic with energy materials, where we try to make materials to, um, uh, for, for the next generation of lithium batteries. Let's see, and then there's Vigelis Manyas. Uh, he studies polymer composites and nano composites. And there's Ching Wang, who studies lots of different things. Another person that can really almost make any material known to man, I think. And uh, one of the interesting things he studies are ferroelectric polymers that are also nanocomposites. Uh, but um, he also does things with uh, thermoelectric materials and, and materials for, um, for batteries. And then, so those are the kind of the two departments with lots of polymer faculty. And then there's four other departments that have some polymer faculty. So uh, one is biomedical engineering and, uh, and Jian Yang, um, uh, is an expert on, on tissue engineering, basically using designing hydrogels uh, to be able to grow um, a, very, a variety of tissues. He also studies uh, biomimetic elastomers. And since my group focuses on rheology, um, quite a few of his students have come over to use our equipment. Uh, okay, and then in chemistry, of course, there's there's people making things even more so, uh, more more of an emphasis on making. There's Beth Alacqua, who uh, is an expert on all sorts of polymer synthesis, and one of the really cool things she does is make these kind of functionalized nano threads that that have all sorts of interesting uses, kind of a unique niche area. Then there's Chris Keating, who um, does lots of bio inspired syntheses and uh, self-assembled, you know, artificial cells and things like this. And then there's Lauren Zarzar, who um, does all sorts of interesting things with um, making materials to control optics and, uh, and active matter. Um, and then in engineering science and mechanics, we have uh, Malik Demorel. Um, uh, I've actually collaborated with Malik in the past. So he, he um, extracts proteins from squid and then he, uh, he gets bacteria to actually make the proteins and then you can scale it up basically. And now he makes you know, polymers and elastomers from these things. And he thinks they're uh, gonna be the, the, the future of polymer science, uh, uh, maybe he's right. And then there's Su Lin Zong um, and he does uh, also simulations of all sorts of nanostructured materials and kind of uh, mechanics, but on a kind of a bio side. So we call that biomechanics. And then in mechanical engineering, we have Zubeda Uanis, who's um, um, his, her group fo focuses on polymer nanocomposites uh, for energy conversion. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Colby. Um, now let's turn this over to Angela. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Angela and I am a fifth year grad student in John Paul Maria's group um, and I'll be uh, covering the electronic, optical, and magnetic materials research 
in our department. Um, so this is a list of faculty that work in this research area um, to go through a little bit about what each of them does. Um, Nassim Alam focuses on characterization and in particular, um, she's kind of our resident expert in transmission electron microscopy, TEM. Um, you heard a little bit from Dr. Dabo, but um, Long King Chen and Ismaila Dabo are both um, more on the computational side. Um, Long King Chen focuses on multi-scale modeling and phase field modeling, and Ismaila Dabo is more on uh, DFT, first principles calculations. Um, but even though they work in computation, um, they interface a lot with experimental groups. Um, and also both of these guys are um, experts in thermodynamics, and one of them will probably be your professor for Thermo. Um, Venkat Gopalan uh, works more on the characterization side, um, specifically in optics. Um, he is an expert in nonlinear optics. Then uh, more on the um, you know, making material side. So Stephanie Law, John Paul Maria, Suzanne Moni um, are all, they all work on um, thin film synthesis or um, semiconductor growth. Uh, Stephanie Law is um, a recent, she recently joined uh, the faculty at Penn State, um, and she will be our expert in molecular beam epitaxy. Um, and she focuses um, both in thin films and uh, I guess ultra thin films, 2D materials. Um, John Paul Maria is my advisor, and um, our lab has a suite of different um, physical vapor deposition um, thin film synthesis techniques. Um, and we focus on um, ferroelectrics, uh, high entropy crystals, and uh, nanophotonics or plasmonics. And Suzanne Moni uh, also does semiconductor growth um, and tuning materials. And I know that she focuses um, especially on the uh, metal contact side of things. Um, Shashank Priya uh, works in functional and multiferroic ceramics um, and also specializes in energy harvesting and photovoltaics. Clive Randall does more bulk ceramics, um, and he is, um, I think he is the one who coined the term cold sintering. So um, one of his specialties is doing very low temperature sintering techniques. Um, Joan Redwing and Josh Robinson are both part of the 2D Crystal Consortium, the 2DCC. Joan Redwing is the director, and Josh Robinson, I believe, is the associate director. And so they specialize in 2D material growth. Um, and then lastly, Susan Troller McKinstry, um, she is, she specializes in crystal chemistry and teaches the crystal chem course here. And, um, she is an expert in ferroelectric and piezoelectric thin films. Um, this is sort of just, uh, reiterating what I highlighted, but these are the main different areas that we focus on, um, in this. Uh, electronic, optical, and magnetic materials research area. Uh, next generation electronics in 2D, um, multifunctional ceramics, films and crystals, energy storage, harvesting, um, and advanced synthesis and characterization. So you can kind of see some of the um, AFM or TEM images that we've collected. Um, and these are photos from some of our laboratories. Great. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for viewing the Intercollege Graduate Degree Program in Material Science and Engineering at Penn State's informational video. If you would like more information or have questions about the graduate program, please email gradoffice at matsy.psu.edu.